So let me begin by introducing uh, our first speaker. And, and let me begin with the observation that uh, is probably poignant to those of us who live in a place like Wyoming. Um, there's actually two kinds of West. There's the kind that you see when you drive around and you read the signs, you know, Fetterman's Massacre, Custer's Last Stand, uh, the various forts, Fort Laramie, Fort Casper, or my favorite, even though it's only foundations, Fort Steele, just outside of Sinclair. Um, it's, it's a land of the past. It's a land often where some event, often a violent event, or a protection against violent events took place. There's a second West that we need to think about, and that's the West that we live in. We are here, we are in the West, and we have a culture, a set of cultures, a group of societies uh, that have made the West our home. And that, those two cultures are separated by what? 100, 150, in some cases more than 150 years. And while the West of the signs is the popular one, it's what gets, shows up in movies, you know, like the 410 to Yuma or whatever. Um, the real West is where we live. And the question that we really should be interested in and be thinking about is how did we get from that early West that we only know through icons to the West where we are? What, what set of changes did this place undergo? Now, of course, a lot of the change came from the coming of people like you and me to this area, but there's also a group of people, uh, what we tend to call the Native Americans, um, who were here, and they underwent a great deal of change and transformation. And uh, Professor Jeff Means, who we will hear from uh, for our first talk, is one of the people who's been studying that uh, and working on that. Uh, Jeff is a, a young assistant professor in the history department, uh, grad came to the university uh, only about three, three and a half years ago, uh, and has been making a name for himself on campus, both in the history department and in the American Indian Studies program, where he's been very active. Um, we know him as uh, a guy with a PhD uh, from Arizona, right? I grew up in Arizona, but I got it from the University of Oklahoma. Oh, oh, University of Oklahoma, even a better place for, for a historian of uh, uh, American Indians. Um, and he's been working on the issue, his, his uh, family background is, is Oglala Lakota, and uh, that has given him a certain amount of interest in the history and the transformations that they have undergone, and he's uh, done a great deal of, of study in that area, interested in their cultural changes, uh, some of their spiritual changes, but more importantly, a set of economic changes. Uh, he's presently uh, writing a book called From Buffalo to Beeves, Cattle and the Political Economy of the Oglala Lakota. Uh, so he's really trying to see how the change of the main animal, from buffalo to uh, uh, cattle, changes the culture, changes the society, and made the society of that section of South Dakota um, uh, different. And today, we're gonna hear from Jeff, and I've got his title here. He's gonna speak to us about the Oglala Lakota and the modernization of American culture from 1840 to 1890. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Stan and Barbara Trackenberg for hosting that wonderful dinner last night, especially Barbara for doing all the work. Uh, but uh, that was very welcoming, and uh, I'd never been to Jackson before. Born here in Rock Springs, Wyoming, uh, but moved very young to uh, Arizona. Grew up in Tempe. Uh, go Sun Devils. Uh, and uh, then uh, found my way back home, and it was, it's an uh, interesting uh, evolution. Uh, I have, on my mother's side of the family, uh, my aunt and uncle have a ranch outside of Newcastle, Wyoming. Uh, and I used to come up and work on that ranch uh, during the summers when I was a youth. 
a uh, very fun time for me. I, I loved uh, doing that kind of work. Uh, now though, however, whenever I visit, uh, I try and avoid branding season because I'm always expected to go and help. Um, and I'm always the shoot guy, uh, which is no fun, but uh, I, you know, I, I grew up with uh, that kind of ranching uh, in my blood, but I, at the same time on my dad's side of the family, who I was kind of estranged from uh, since we'd moved to Phoenix, uh, were Oglala Lakota, or the Sioux, uh, if you're wondering, who the, which is why I put the Sioux in parentheses there, uh, so that you'd know who we were talking about. Most of my students don't when we start the semester. Um, and uh, I, so I, I've lived uh, in, in two worlds in my life, and I kind of like to start uh, my talk, which is going to be really basically about American identity and Native American identity and how they shaped and informed one another and how our perspectives toward one another have uh, altered how we act and believe and, and perceive one another uh, with, a, with a couple of stories from my youth. Uh, one summer, I'm working on the ranch, uh, and as you can guess from looking at me, uh, and my students always find it interesting, uh, I don't look particularly Indian, do I? I uh, take after my mother. All of my siblings uh, also look more like me. Uh, rather than my father. You see my father, and you're like, there's an Indian, there's a Sioux. You see me, and you don't think that. Um, so I'm working on the ranch, and uh, some, a neighbor comes by. And as we do in, in Wyoming, we stop and say hello. And he wanted a, a visit with uh, my uncle, and he decided to tell a joke. Uh, and he said, hey, you know what they call beer cans on Indian reservations? Indian artifacts. Um, and ah, ha, ha, everybody's laughing. And then afterward, uh, he was introduced to me. And he said, and he goes, this is my nephew, Jeff Means. And he, he goes, oh, well, you're not related to the Russell Means, are you? And I said, well, yes, actually, he's my uncle. And the look on his face was flawless, just perfect. Um, embarrassment, chagrin, uh, anger uh, at being caught telling that kind of a joke to someone who he didn't know was an Indian, uh, that kind of a thing. Uh, and it was an interesting, you know, getting into that kind of a, a cultural uh, mix as a youth and experiencing that. But there was a flip side to that, because I was visiting my father once uh, when I was I, pretty close to the same age, probably about 14 or 15, and uh, he had a friend named Floyd Westerman visiting. Now, Floyd Westerman was a uh, folk singer and uh, humorist and so on. And this was, I believe, the summer of 1977. I'm not sure you can check me on this, but <sighs> while I was there, an American icon died. John Wayne died. Now, I grew up watching John Wayne movies. The Quiet Man is still one of my favorites, and he should have won the Oscar for that. Um, I love John Wayne. They were thrilled to death. I can still see Floyd Westerman with his long hair and he's combing and going and forgiving. He goes, thank God, thank God, thank God John Wayne is dead. And I remember thinking, I love John Wayne. This is horrible. And coming, you know, again, not spending an enormous amount of time with my father or the Indian culture, I had no idea why they would feel that way. Why would they have anger toward an actor? Well, it was some of the things that he had said, which I wasn't privy to. Uh, which basically came down to, well, we beat them once, you know, they should shut up uh, and just be quiet. Uh, and so there's these two kinds of worlds in which I lived. And it's an interesting kind of uh, dichotomy. So uh, where, how did we get here? How did, you know, I'm an Indian. I identify myself as an Indian. I uh, am in a member of my tribe. Uh, and, and I was talking last night to several people um, the fact is, most, people, most Indians today look more like me than they do my father. You've probably met hundreds of Indians in your life and never known. Uh, so, how did we get here? And what are our perceptions? And how did we get the perception we have of, of uh, American Indians? Well, it all starts, well, when does it start? 1492, but uh, for the purposes of our discussion, uh, let's take a, a look at the latter half of the 19th century. Now, the latter half of the 19th century was a wrenching time uh, in American history. There's massive changes going on to the nation, just absolutely massive changes. Um, 
we're changing from a world that we would feel so alien in to one that we're much more familiar with, cities, these kinds of things. We're moving away from apprenticeship and farming to wage labor. And you think, well, okay, that's a natural economic evolution. But when you think about the hands-on changes that are going on here, this is the difference between freedom and self-sufficiency for young men and women to now being dependent upon the wages that they're being paid by someone else. You're not, no longer going to be uh, a shoemaker. Nobody wants, it's too expensive. You can simply mass produce shoes now. Okay, uh, it, and these are massive cultural changes. Uh, getting away from that kind of feeling of self-sufficiency to one of more of helplessness, uh, really, it was, it was something very difficult, and the nation is going to go through many uh, different kinds of violent problems, unionization, various th different things about all of this. We're also moving from a very rural nation to an urban one. 1890 is when the census first showed that there was now more people living in cities than there were in the country. Uh, it's going from the bucolic ideas of uh, what we think of as the yeoman farmer and so on to this, what you're more familiar with uh, from our lives. Uh, and you know, the bustling scene of, I believe this is New York City uh, in 1890. Uh, that kind of a life is completely different than what people had known before. How does that affect us? How do we feel about that? Uh, these are all kinds of things that, that Americans are dealing with. Agrarianism to manufacturing. We're becoming the world's manufacturer. We don't do that anymore, but we used to be. Okay? We used to be uh, you know, the most powerful manufacturing nation in the world. Uh, and we got there uh, in, in a, a remarkably quick time. You know, relatively historically speaking and so on. And again, going away from the idea that really founded this nation. Thomas Jefferson's uh, concepts of the yeoman agrarian farmer and the ideas that were tied to working with the land. Um, Jefferson espoused the idea that it was the land, it was working with the land that gave us our democratic zeal, our independence, our self-sufficiency. It was these things that, sprang, that helped spring forth our independence from England. So what happens to those kinds of things? What's going to happen to democracy once we get away from that? These are important questions that the nation is having to deal with this, at this time, um, during you know, 1840, 1890, and so on. We're also becoming a much more national or homogenistic nation at this time. Uh, this is a, a period when uh, transportation was still limited, 1840, and most people didn't travel too far from where they were born. You could spend your entire life within 40 miles of where you were born. This is going to change dramatically in a very quick time, 50 years. All of a sudden, the railroads are open almost across the nation. For a cheap ticket, you can travel 1,000 miles. You can do anything. And the reason I have these images up here uh, is because Madison Avenue, I apologize if you knew uh, from Madison Avenue. I love Madison Avenue the, because it's a wonderful image for histor historic, you know, uh, critical thinking. Um, what happens as Americans begin to consume the same kinds of products, whether you're in Alabama or Massachusetts? If you begin to experience the same kinds of music, the same kind of dress, the same kind of entertainment, well, it, you're, you're creating a culture that uh, is much more willing to think alike, education is much more similar, you're building that national consensus. Uh, you can now travel across this country and experience no real taste of any of the regions you're in. You can stay at the same kinds of hotels, you can eat at the same restaurants, you can, I mean the, literally you can actually eat at the same restaurants no matter where you go. Right? Now if you're smart of course you get off the beaten track and you enjoy a little bit of the local cuisine and that kind of thing, but it's this kind of push toward homogenization, toward a national culture that's really going to begin to make the United States question, where are we going? Also, U.S. territory is going to expand dramatically. Um, a question I always love to ask my students just to see how many of them know it. We fought a war in the 1840s. Who did we fight that war with? Anybody? 
Yay! <laughs> You're all a wonderfully educated group. Um, actually, I have to say, Wyoming students uh, always uh, are uh, tremendously surprising for me. They, they're, they're well ready uh, for college. Uh, not to really disparage Oklahoma or anything, but the students there were not as engaged and not as well read and not uh, as ready. They did not tend to know about the Mexican-American War. Um, but uh, obviously, there's a tremendously large chunk of territory that's going to be incorporated within the United States. Okay, well, it's manifest destiny. This is, you know, God wanted us to go from sea to shining sea, and by gosh, who are we to argue with God? Um, and this is the way it's going to be. Uh, and we do it. The United States goes from sea to shining sea, but that westward expansion brings up massive kinds of questions again for the United States. Now, for most, historically, when you talk about westward expansion and race, what's the context? Anybody? Slavery. slavery. Where is slavery going to be allowed? Et cetera, et cetera. Well, the transition of American identity, Americans are going to redefine themselves. All those changes that I just previously mentioned, plus the United States grows by 66%, languages spoken in the country Go, increased by over 100 percent. Okay, Westward, it does uh, expand uh, and create a, a racial crisis in slavery, but it's just not over slavery. The United States and, I mean, our congressmen, our national thinkers and leaders are talking about how are we going to deal with all this new territory they just incorporated. You know what? Guess what kind of people we got living in the Southwest now? Mexicans, yeah, okay. Um, did you know that there was a debate after the defeat of the Mexicans on whether or not we were going to go and, and just simply absorb the entire Mexican nation and make it the United States, part of the United States? Do you know why we decided not to? Because guess what Mexico was too full of? <laughs> Mexicans. It was not believed at the time that that would be uh, prudent. Uh, and it would dilute the good American stock if we, uh, if we did that. Uh, and because the Southwest was sparsely populated, uh, we could take that. All right. Um, so at this time, though, also, not only their evolutions in all the things that we've talked about, agrarianism to uh, ruralism and manufacturing and uh, urbanization and so on, but, you know, I mean, the, the uh, enlightenment has occurred, and and it, the thinking about natural laws and sciences is, has been progressing uh, during this period. And now, concepts that before had been seen as malleable by people like Thomas Jefferson again. Thomas Jefferson was a great believer and one of the greatest thinkers of his time, and he, he espoused the idea that races such as uh, the blacks and Native Americans and so on would eventually evolve to become white. Because it wasn't anything physiological, it was cultural. Their exposure to savagery, the woods, had created this darkness in them. And once they had been exposed to the awesomeness that is the United States, that that would all go away. Now, he got that through empirical observation as well, because being a slave owner, uh, he saw young slave children all the time. And what's unique about babies that are just born? They're much lighter pigment, pigmented. They are nearly white. Same for Native Americans. Well, see, they're born almost white. It's just that savagery that gets them. Okay? So they'll evolve. Race then is malleable. Race is something that we can deal with. Now, though, by the 1840s, 50s, 60s, 70s, Science is starting to do away with that. In fact, really, um, science is starting to look for reasons to separate the races. Guess why? Slavery. Okay, well, we have to justify slavery, right? So there's got to be differences, and they have to be innate. They have to be hard and fixed, okay? So therefore, race becomes immutable, okay? Um, it's innate and unchanging. There's now, and the, uh, William Gilmore Sims was a popular writer of dime novels and, and so on back in the late 1800s. Um, and he always talked about Mexican monkeys and bloodthirsty Indians. Um, and the, the, to that term, bloodthirsty, of course, you know, permeates 
uh, this. And I was, I was actually talking to someone last night, I won't point and call them out, but you know, that term bloodthirsty, it's, it's alive and well today when it's in, incorporated with Native Americans um, as dangerous. Uh, what was Osama bin Laden's code name during the attack? Geronimo. Savage. Terrorist. Yes, yeah, Native American, we're, we're not really thrilled with that. Uh, we'd like an apology, but we're not going to get one. Um, because you're equating Native Americans with terrorists. And Hello. Uh, anyway, um, I see I digress. This will take longer than 40 minutes. I, I, I just know already. All right. Um, what we're looking for is scientific explanations, explanations and reasonings on race. Okay. Um, how do we examine these racial differences? Okay, well, how do, and how do we make them jibe with what we know biblically? And things like this, right? Um, because if race is unchanging, that doesn't jibe with Genesis, does it? Because then if, if you can't change races, there can't be more than one. Unless you come up with polygeneticists. Polygenesis which is, obviously, since you're all educated, you know, means many beginnings. So, there wasn't just Adam and Eve. There was an Adam and Eve for blacks and for Indians. Okay, and so we're not even really related at all. Okay, which is why miscegenation was so horrible. The idea of mixing and, and muting these kinds of races together. Um, sciences like the craniotomy. What's craniotomy? Yeah, the me measuring skulls and, and, and trying to show racial differences through measuring skulls. Now, all of the, the, the problem with this, and this is true for any science today, is if you already know the answer and then you go looking for evidence, yeah, you, you're always going to find it. But, you know, I mean, they have a hard time I explaining why Daniel Webster's brain capacity was much smaller than Mangus Colorado's, who was an Apache war leader. Was he smarter than Daniel Webster? Uh, oh no. Uh, but of course, so what do they find? They find that on large, brain capacity is much larger for Anglos, um, and so on and so forth. And, and these kinds of sciences were alive and well. Um, and so, you know, race is a very important thing. And of course, that has to do with identity. Who are we? Who are we as Americans? Um, and how is incorporating the West into our worldview going to change us? Do we want to be changed? No. Okay, so what, what, what must we do, you know? Um, and how are we going to fit Native Americans into this? Okay, um, by the way, in the East, they're having their own racial problems because who's coming to the New World over on the East Coast? Ooh, the Irish, first of all. Ooh. And then uh, later than that, yeah, then you got Italians and Slavs and Jews and all these undesirable people. Oh, Chinese people on the West Coast. Um, and again, I digress, so I'm, I know it's going to take longer. But anyway, I have to tell you this story about uh, the American Medical Association. There's a journal article that talked about Chinese-itis, which was really an interesting kind of a thing because it's inherited, inherited, I mean. So in other words, it's throughout their, the Chinese race, and its, and its kinds of uh, symptoms are laziness and, you know, uh, uh, Oh, what was that word we gave the Japanese? Inscrutableness. Um, and, you know, you're, you're susceptible to uh, drug and alcohol abuse and all of these kinds of things. And, but, not, but what's interesting is it's a medical miracle because it was inherited and it's, you know, unique to the Chinese, but it was also contagious. So you could catch it if you were anywhere near the Chinese people. Um, so you had to watch out for that, or you, you could catch laziness uh, and various other kind of a sundry things. Um, and this is in the American Medical Association Journal. So um, this is, I mean, this is, you know, just science at the time. Well, how, do, how, how are Native Americans going to fit into all of this? Indians in American consciousness. Where have Native Americans fit in before? Uh, colonial period. Uh, during the colonial period, uh, Native Americans were often partners or enemies. Uh, they had a much more equal footing with European powers at this time. Uh, and, most, you know, one really good historian, Jill Lepore, in a book called The Name of War, uh, very, I think, articulately and convincingly argues that it, w it was the Native Americans that provided 
the uniquely American, in other words, not English experience that's going to allow this unique identity to emerge in which we no longer see ourselves as English. We're different than the English um, and therefore need to break from them. And it was because Native Americans provided uh, that uh, forging kind of fire that was going to create that independence and self-sufficiency and democracy within our uh, very beings uh, and so on. Um, and that's going to last right up through the American Revolution. Now, after the American Revolution, though, the United States is going to view, uh, and rather incorrectly, Native Americans as conquered nations. Uh, they do so because the British had tried to get most Native Americans to ally with them. They didn't all, but uh, many of them did side with the British. And so, therefore, we've beaten the British. Therefore, we've beaten their allies. That's how things work. Well, not in Native American culture. Um, and it's going to take some really significant defeats uh, in the Ohio Valley country uh, for the United States to finally say, okay, maybe you're not. Um, the most notable was Arthur Sinclair's defeat. Anybody heard of Arthur Sinclair? Arthur Sinclair was the governor of the Northwest Territories, um, and he was going to lead a 2,500-man expedition into the Ohio River uh, country to attack uh, uh, Blue Jacket and Little Turtle, uh, who were... Uh, leading a, a resistance, um, a Miami and Delaware resistance of many different tribes against the United States. And uh, the defeat was just astronomically uh, problem, uh, troubling for the United States. 632 Americans were going to die uh, in this attack, which dwarfs Custer's last stand, by the way, just dwarfs it. Um, uh, it they had been marching into this territory for five weeks. Uh, and it took them two days to run all the way back where they started, uh, the Americans, that is. It was a massive defeat, uh, poorly led, um, and the problem is it was militia, uh, and everybody dogs on militia and so on. But who are militia? They're just you and I with our guns. And so when the shooting starts, are we well trained? Well, I am. I'm a United States Marine, so I stayed, didn't fought, and died. You guys all ran away. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, some of you veterans, you had my back. You're dead, too. Um, you know, it, and uh, this, was, this led to the first uh, congressional investigation. This led to the first cabinet meeting. Washington called his cabinet together. How are we going to explain this? Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, it was a massive defeat. So, okay, we, we, the United States very quickly begins to realize, okay, we're, they're not conquered nations. All right. But as the United States begin to, begins to move more westward, Okay, uh, they, they be, Native Americans lose the ability to inflict their own identity on Americans. This is a power relationship, basically. The United States has solidified itself well enough on the East Coast now, and over the decades after the American Revolution, Native Americans become, uh, you know, uh, basically invisible. They're in the background now. They used to be seen on the city streets of New York and Philadelphia all the time. They would send emissaries and so on. But now you don't see that much anymore. And that gives the United States the power to perceive Indians as they see fit. Okay? And how, what are they? They're anachronistic. They're out of time. They're primitive. They're obstacles to progressive expansion. Um, and therefore, they just need to go away. Okay? Uh, they just need to go away. Um, they were seen as doomed savages. Yes, they were great for testing the American metal. Again, uh, uh, and at the same time, though, interestingly, there are aspects of American culture that, uh, even during that period of expansion, saw them as very sympathetic kind of icons and, and really wanted to try and protect them and, and so on. There are a few notable uh, exceptions. Their voices tend to get drowned out. Um, uh, Mark Twain gave a particularly interesting uh, remark to the New England Society of Philadelphia. Um, I'm just going to read briefly from this. Basically what it was is uh, an, an interesting evolution in New England. New England had originally believed that they had exterminated all the Native Americans in New England. They were declared extinct uh, quite early uh, in, in American history. Uh, and they disappeared from the Thanksgiving narrative. But as New England became less and less regionally important in American politics, as new states began to form and as the South became more powerful and so on, New England started to have a little panic attack. Uh, we're really important. Listen to us. 
were the founding fathers and so on and so forth. Um, and they brought back Thanksgiving. And again, they had a tendency to, to leave out the Native Americans. Well, if, you, if you've read Mark Twain, and hopefully you have, he's very funny and very sat satirical. And um, he's invited to speak at this society of basically um, New Englanders from Philadelphia slapping themselves on the back about how great New England is. Um, and uh, he, he gives a really, if you ever get a chance to get your hands on the whole speech, it's just hilarious. Um, I'm just going to read the part that's uh, about Native Americans. He's kind of just, he's really needling these New Englanders. He goes, my first American ancestor, gentlemen, was an Indian, an early Indian. Your ancestors skinned him alive, and I'm an orphan. Not one drop of my uh, blood flows in that Indian's veins today. I st stand here lone and forlorn without an ancestor. They skinned him. I do not object to that if they needed his fur, but alive, gentlemen, alive. They skinned him alive and before company. That is what rankles. Think how he must have felt, for he was a sensitive person and easily embarrassed. If he had been a bird, it would have been all right, and no violence done to his feelings because he would have been considered dressed. <laughs> but, but he was not a bird, gentlemen. He was a man, and probably one of the most undressed men that ever was. I ask you to put yourselves in his place. I ask it as a favor. I ask it as a tardy act of justice. I ask it in the interest of fidelity to the traditions of your ancestors. I ask it that, you, that, that the world may contemplate with vision unobstructed by disguising swallowtails and white crevettes, that spectacle which the true New England society ought to present. Cease to come to these annual orgies in this hollow modern mockery, the surplusage of raiment. Come in character. Come in the summer grace. Come in the unadorned simplicity. Come in the free and joyous costume which your, an which your stained ancestors provided for mine. Really, you know, the last thing they wanted to hear, right? Uh, it was somebody talking to them about their history with Native Americans and how that was not quite uh, something that they should be proud of. Um, and it, it, it's interesting because in 1881 at this time, again, it shows, though, the power of the American ability to marginalize Native Americans completely. Uh, Native Americans are really not anything to think about uh, as far as national ideas, concepts, and, and, and Thanksgiving or anything else. Um, all of this that I've been discussing, all these you know, really wrenching changes in the United States, these concepts of identity and how do Native Americans fit into all of this. Well, um, foreshadowing myself, I already talked about Thomas Jefferson's agrarian ideals, so that's good. Um, that'll save some time. Uh, <laughs> transcendentalism. Um, well, I'm sure you've all been forced to read it sometime in your high school or college lives. Uh, Henry David Thoreau's Walden or something along that, that line. That the idea that nature is key to a good life. That nature is intrinsically and inherently valuable in and of itself. And that's an important kind of evolution in American thinking at this time. Why? Because who is intrinsically and inherently part of nature? Indians. So, if we need to value nature, does that mean we need to value Indians? Uh, these are the kinds of questions that are starting to come up. Um, and this is why there are some that are saying, yes, we do. All right? uh, urbanization has created a separation from nature. Most American citizens now are living in cities. They don't spend their time taking nice walks to the lovely Jackson countryside uh, and the Elk Preserve and the beauty that is here. Uh, they uh, live lives of quiet desperation in unadorned filth and poverty in cities. And what is that doing to our citizenry? What, uh, what does that separation from nature mean? Well, it means a flawed, inferior, American. Is that what we really want? No. Hence, Central Park. The bringing back of nature to the city. The opportunity for man to interact with nature, even briefly, in order to gain that power back, that self-sufficiency, etc. Um, so, and during this time, Easterners are really having an identity crisis when it comes to masculinity as well, uh, especially after the Civil War. Uh, during the, when, when modernization and the Industrial Revolution really got, got under why, uh, you see a hearkening back to uh, 
chivalric times. There, there are many uh, chivalric societies uh, that talk about knights and, uh, and these kinds of things uh, in the uh, uh, American East, but also in, in a, a tremendous emergence of talking about Native Americans. Because Native Americans, while, you know, uh, marginalized and so on, they were uniquely masculine. And by proving ourselves against Native Americans, we proved our masculinity. We defeated them. They're masculine, therefore that we're masculine. But that doesn't hold for these Easterners. Okay, the Virginian out there, okay, why that book was so unbelievably popular. Anybody read the Virginian? Yeah, um, my mom gave it to me as a Christmas present, and it was uh, a really interesting read. Uh, but, you know, as a historian, I cannot enjoy those things. It's horrible. I've ruined myself for movies and, and books, because uh, I always think, oh, that's not true. Uh, anyway, uh, I can't, I just can't. Anyway, uh, so they're working for wages, they're separated for land, they're, they're not masculine anymore. So they're going to look to the West for images of manhood. Uh, Indians were equated with nature and still are. Um, I'm sure all of you remember uh, Iron Eyes Cody and the commercials back in the 70s to clean up America. The single teardrop coming down his cheek as this Native American emerges from the canoe and walks up and the, the shoreline is strewn with garbage and diapers and styrofoam and some car drives by and throws a big bag of trash out and splat, right? And then he cries and basically the message is white people are ruining America. If you could be more like us, we'd, be clean, we'd clean it up, right? Because we Native Americans are at one. Harmony is the word that's often used, right? Native Americans live at harmony, in harmony with nature. Um, it turns out Native Americans are just as willing to shape nature to suit their needs as anyone else, but um, we never let the facts get in the way of a good story. So um, they're of nature, and, it's, and that's their image, especially today. Indians are definitely masculine, uh, much like myself. Uh, <laughs> hey. Uh, Frederick Jackson Turner's thesis is going to emerge in 1893, and this is going to be uh, a key. Uh, it, basically, what his message is is the frontier is gone. Frontier is gone. The American access to the things that made us self-sufficient, independent, democratic, are gone. That Jefferson ideal of the agrarian farmer and so on, it's gone. Where are we going to turn to? How is the United States going to regain its masculinity? Um, how is uh, the United States going to um, incorporate Native Americans into society? Well, I'll leave it at there and we'll tease you a little bit and we'll come back to that. Because I want to give you a little bit of history on the Lakota. Um, by the way, the reason uh, most of the, my relatives and most of my friends, they, all, they, they will call themselves the Sioux. Yeah, we're the Sioux. Okay, I'm trying to break that habit because we, we're the Lakota. But Sioux is a name that was given to us by the French. Um, it's an Assiniboine word that either means basically snake in the grass or enemy. And that's not what we want to call ourselves. Um, so, uh, it's the Lakota. All right. Um, and we, why, why do the Sioux, the Lakota, occupy such a unique and powerful place in American you know, cultural consciousness. Why, are, why do the Sioux, you know, I mean, when they made the movie Dances with Wolves, well, in the book, what tribe's he with? Anybody know? The Comanche. But when they made the movie, they switch it up to the Sioux. Why? Well, because we're cooler than the Comanche. We're far better than them. Um, <laughs> objectively speaking. Um, how did we get there? And we'll just take a quick run through here. Um, Lewis and Clark is going to have a, you know, their famous journey uh, to the Pacific Ocean. And the only tribe that they ever had any trouble with was the Sioux. Um, the, he called uh, the Sioux the vilest miscreants of the savage race. Okay. Um, I had relatives there, Crowfeather and his wife, her many pipes. Uh, basically, this is a... Uh, an artist's rendering of a very famous scene, and ba basically what had happened is that the Lakota were very well aware of uh, Americans, had been uh, you know, exposed to traders and various different things for a while, and knew through their trade with other tribes all about Americans. 
Um, and when they came through, they expected them to pay just like any other traveler would. Okay, and they wanted tobacco. And Thomas Jefferson, being the good American, saw this as extortion, um, and he didn't want to pay. Um, and so uh, he was, they were trying to just basically take off and not give the Lakota anything. And the Lakota grab hold of the boat and won't let it go. So Thomas Jefferson says, oh, I'll show them. I'm going to fire off our uh, arc buses, our little cannons, um, and that'll scare them. Um, so he fires them all off, and they weren't scared. Uh, turns out, yeah, they know all about guns and cannons, and they're not, you know, unless you're pointing them at us, we're really not too worried about it. Um, and also, there was a lot more of them, and they were much more willing uh, to kick up a fight. So what did they end up doing? They ended up giving the Lakota tobacco, okay? But it was a rocky start, all right? Um, so how did the Lakota rise to prominence? Um, and we were, I was talking about this again last night at the dinner. You know, on the southern plains, the Comanche uh, rose to be the dominant force. And on the northern plains, it's the Lakota. Well, why? Why did the Lakota uh, rise to this position of power? Well, how can they defeat other tribes and have some massive territory, which includes South Dakota, North Dakota, the northern half of Nebraska, parts of Wyoming and Montana? Okay, any way you look at it, that's a big chunk of land. Okay, how did that happen? Um, disease had been absolutely devastating to many of the Native American tribes uh, on the plains, especially the sedentary riverine tribes, such as the Rikara, Mandan, and Hidatsa along the Missouri River and various other different rivers. These were agrarian tribes for the most part, and as closely packed populations, disease ravaged them. Um, and it comes through in various different waves in the mid-1700s, and then again, right around the time of the American Revolution, and there are tribes just suffering devastating epidemics. Uh, the Lakota were just marginally affected by this because they were more dispersed, but also because later uh, Josiah Pilcher, who is the uh, American Indian agent for this region, uh, has enough smallpox vaccines to give to one tribe. And guess who gets them? The most powerful tribe. The tribe that actually at this time is a great friend of the United States government. Joshua Pilcher is going to say in one of his reports that there was no greater friend to the United States government than the Sioux. Why? Because we had helped them beat other tribes. They had sent emissaries and said, hey, we're going to go attack the Arikara. Will you help us? And we're like, yes. Okay. Um, no problem. Um, we had managed uh, you know, to get large horse herds. Horse herds were really important on the northern plains especially. Winter's a really tough time. You need 20 horses per family to make it, okay? And it took time to develop that kind of sustainability uh, for these horse hoods because what do horses need? They need a lot of grass, don't they, and water. What if you only have so much land, though? What do you got to do? You got to look around and say, who can I whip out of their land, okay? Which is why there are other tribes that don't feel as fondly toward the Sioux as they should, like the Pawnee, the Crow, the Oto, the Omaha, the Ponca, the Blackfeet, well, and various other tribes. In one instance, uh, there was a, a, a fight between them, uh, which was witnessed by American agents who would went with the Pawnee on a buffalo hunt in 1873. It's called the Battle of Massacre Canyon, so you can guess it didn't turn out too well. Um, but what happened was there was probably about 500 Pawnee, this includes women and children, moving out for a buffalo hunt when they were attacked by 1,200 Lakota warriors. Now, yeah, I mean, just the numbers, as you can see, the numbers themselves are just uh, too one-sided. 1,200 warriors are, are attacking an entire Pawnee area. And it basically the message was, this is our hunting territory. Don't come here hunting buffalo. Why? is, you know, why are, they, are these tribes so aggressive and so on? Because this is life and death survival. If you're going to be a nomadic equestrian culture on the Great Plains, you need access to hunting territory, you need access to grazing territory, you need access to wintering territory, and that means somebody else has to give it to you, one way or another, okay? So this, this kind of fighting had been going on for 100 years during this period. Um, uh, they were victorious uh, in, in most of their uh, encounters with other tribes, uh, Blackfeet and Crow. Um, surprisingly, there was one group that, uh, because of their significant leader, managed to hold the, the Lakota off from expansion. 
and it's kind of geographically relevant at this point. What tribe and what leader do you? The Shoshone and Chief Washakie. He put a whooping on the Lakota uh, in one little encounter. Uh, killed half the uh, uh, invading band and chased the rest across the plains, smacking them with their quartz and bows. Very embarrassing. Uh, and, uh, I mean, some of the Lakota are going to get home and literally hang themselves in shame for what happened. Uh, so, you know, Chief Washakie managed to hold them off for a while, but we don't know how that all worked out. But um, basically what we have here then, during the 1850s, 60s, 70s, is two really expanding military powers coming into contact that had been previously fast friends, and that's the United States and the Lakota. Um, both groups are seeking territory. Both groups have used the military to get their territory, um, and it's going to be an inevitable clash between the two. Um, this is going to, of course, lead to uh, the Sioux Wars between, uh, that go down in history that everyone's familiar with. We have Red Cloud's War, uh, the Custer, Custer Expedition, uh, numerous smaller conflicts during this period. Uh, this is the famous uh, image that most people uh, associate with Custer's Last Stand. And this, in fact, was what, what most Americans got their history lesson from. Um, and if you look really closely, you'll guess why. And why, and yeah, home of Budweiser, Anheuser-Busch. This was either a poster or a mirror that hung in every bar in America, right? that sold Anheuser-Busch. And so people are sitting at the bar and they're looking at this. And so what do they think? This is what happened, right? Custer, framed in light at the center, in his buckskin, fighting to the last, as he's surrounded and his troops are dying about him and so on. Um, I mean, historically, that's not what happened at all. Uh, there are uh, a lot, quite a few studies that have shown that it was not this one last stand kind of a thing. But uh, it makes great Hollywood. It makes great... You know, they died with their boots on. I think that was Errol Flynn. You know, I mean, uh, it's it's great. It's great story. Okay. Um, also, what's going to allow? I mean, we, we have that warfare, Custer's Last Stand, and so on. That's going to be really important because when did news hit the East that Custer's command had been wiped out? What date? It, the battle happened on June 25th. July 4th. 1876, which was our 100th anniversary, our centennial. Yay, everybody. Oh, Custer's dead. Oh, that's in the paper. Uh, something that sticks in your mind. Also, um, basically by the 1880s, uh, Indians had be become pacified. All right. Um, now they're simply exotic rather than dangerous. Uh, actually, now the new fear is going to be of a breakout from a reservation. There's no longer any real fear of Native American military power. It's just that fear that there might be some that break off the reservation, kind of like a slave revolt in the South before the war. Um, this, uh, and what ends up happening is uh, the Lakota or the Sioux take a dominant place in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, okay, and which had many different connotations to it. Uh, but basically, uh, and, basi and also you'll notice show actually is never in the title, but it's just sticks, so I went ahead and put it on the title of my slide. Anyway, Buffalo Wills, Wild West, and the Congress of the Rough Riders of the World, um, which actually came about later, but uh, that's when they had Mongols and Tartars and all these people running around as well. Um, yeah, even from, from the poster, advertising posters, and from his relationship again with Sitting Bull, which was uh, very important, uh, this show is going to travel all over the United States of America and Europe. Of course, employing people like Annie Oakley and so on, and her famous shot of, uh, what was that prince's name, German prince, Philip? I can't, anyway, he shot the cigarette out of his mouth. That would have been problematic if she'd have missed and killed a prince. If um, but, you know, I mean, it, basically the message was we're taking realism to the people of America. And they reenacted, 10 minutes? Okay. Uh, they reenacted uh, the Battle of, uh, of Little Bighorn. They reenacted... Uh, eventually Wounded Knee was going to be reenacted. Uh, they're going to uh, try and bring realism to this. Um, actually, Buffalo Bill is going to fa fail miserably at his movie attempts because he tries to depict that realism again. And if you're sitting in the audience at a movie theater, snore, what do you want? You want a story, don't you? 
You want a theme. You want a love story. You want some, you know. So he, he's going to fail miserably as other movies take their, oh, take their place. Uh, how do I get back again? I forget. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, there we go. There we go. Um, there we go. Um, if you want to read a great book about uh, his, Buffalo Bill's life, look at Lord Lewis Warren's Buffalo Bill's America. Um, it's big and fat and thick, but it's worth the read. All right. Also, dime novels. Uh, many different Lakota leaders' trips to Washington, D.C., which was always a big deal, especially for those who were more sympathetic to, toward the Indians. Red Cloud, of course, being a, a big favorite because of his... Um, uh, the Red Clouds War in, from 66 to 68. Uh, Helen Hunt Jackson's famous book, A Century of Dishonor, which came out in 1881, which uh, depicted seven tribes, the Sioux being one of them, and, and their relations, and the United States has failed relations with tribes over these years. Um, Libby Custer, and there's a true love story for the ages. Um, those two uh, were inseparable. Libby Custer, to keep her husband from being blamed for this massacre and to keep his memory alive, is going to write several books, um, uh, including Boots and Saddles in 1885, which are going to tr trumpet again and put the Lakota in the key role of history okay, for the American public. Her most, uh, and the most famous Indian battle, of course, is Custer's Last Stand. I t told you about Sinclair's battle. Nobody knows that one. We lost 632 people. Nobody knows. But Custer's last stand we know, don't we? Why? Libby Custer's a big reason. All right. Also, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was uh, a huge uh, Western aficionado, as you well know from your history. Um, owned a ranch out here, was active in this region a lot as well. All right. So, Wounded Knee then occurs, December 29th, 1890. This is really the last American and Indian battle. Um, it's really not a battle, but we'll call it that. Um, I put battle in quotes because in the history books, any battle in which Indians was ki were killed was a battle. Any battle in which Americans were killed was a massacre. Um, <laughs> Fetterman's Massacre. Okay, it was army soldiers. How were they massacred? They were in a military engagement. Anyway, uh, Eastern politics shaped by the uh, ghost dance. President Benjamin Harrison uh, was president from uh, 89 to 93, um, and in an attempt to get more Republican support for his uh, plans, tariff, things like that, um, he is going to make South Dakota a state in 89. Um, he is going to send the largest peacetime e army ever to South Dakota to quash this uprising of the Sioux uh, because of the ghost dance. Um, really, he does it to help out South Dakota's economy which was struggling at this time, because what does a huge army need? Supplies, right? Um, he's also trying to get uh, South Dakotan voters and their House representatives to elect a sen senators, that, which will be you know, more amenable to his political viewpoints and so on. And if you want to read a good book on that, Heather Cock Richardson's book, Wounded Knee, talks about this larger context here. Um, but then, as the turn of the century came around, and I'm going to go a little faster here because I got the clock run and they're going to play me off. Uh, I'd like to thank, no, I can't. Um, uh, the Boy Scouts of America was founded in 1910, but it had its, its origins even earlier than that. Uh, Charles Eastman was part of this. He's Oyeshe. He was a Dakota. Uh, he was part of the original founding of the Boy Scouts, uh, which really looks to its beginnings from Ernest Thompson Seton who was given the name Black Wolf by the Sioux. Um, he actually is going to learn the Lakota language, and he uh, is going to have the uh, Woodcraft Indians group founded in 1902. And basically, it's about that idea of that masculinity and that separation from nature um, and so on, where he's trying to teach the youth of America the kinds of things that they're going to need to know to grow up to be real men. Because you can't be a real man if you're living in a city and that's all you do. Okay, then you end up to be English. Um, and we all know they're effeminate. Uh, the Gospel of the Red Man and the Indian Bible is one of the books that are going to come out, uh, written by Eaton. Um, the seven Indian contributors, out of the seven Indian contributors, three are going to be Sioux. Um, uh, none of the other four are of a similar tribe. Uh, those are going to be Standing Bear, Sunflower, and Charles Eastman, or Yishe. Um, he's going to have a song called The Three uh, Sioux Scouts. In other words, it's the Sioux tribe that is really 
uh, being looked to by the beginning of these kinds of scout movements, and especially the Boy Scouts of America. Um, then there's also the Sioux and the hobbyists. Okay, what was this movement about? It's about national salvation again. It's about national salvation. They took this stuff seriously. Let me read a, a quick clip from the Chicago Sun-Times about the importance of Native Americans. Upon the picturesque uh, Aborigines rests the burden of maintaining a worthy American folk tradition. It is the Indians who starkly maintain the primitive, rugged virtues that once were shared by the white Americans, for they have not been led astray by money. They are the guardians of the temple. We can gird up our loins and go back to the lodge of our red brother and lead against the delights of the simple life. The good Indian may stake us to a new start in the quest of fortune, beauty, and salvation. Um, that's putting a lot of pressure on us, I think, uh, to save American culture. But um, it's, it, that, it also, what were their goals about saving Native American culture? Um, Reginald and Gladys uh, Laubin, who we, uh, was very active around here, and many of you may have known, uh, they met in 1922 as teens. Their career is going to span 70 years. Um, they are going to write books on Indian teepees, dancing and archery. In fact, someone here probably is building a teepee out of that book that I know of. Um, and one of their famous stories that they always talked about was meeting Chief One Bull, who was Sitting Bull's nephew and actually had been at Custer's last stand. And they met him in 1933. Um, and he gave them their names, Tatanka Wanila, or One Bull, and Weyaka Washtewin, uh, or Good Feather Woman. So, you know, very exciting stuff for them. Um, here are some images of the Lobbins and it, doing their hobbyist movement. They're trying, again, they're trying to save America, but they're also trying to save Native culture. Um, you look at them, it's, it's just priceless. This is him dancing down here um, in, in, in their uh, various different uh, arraignment and so on. These are some of the books that they have. And ho this hobbyist movement is going to move not only across America, but also Europe. It's now on Facebook. Um, there are state organizations, California, uh, Louisiana, Texas, etc. There's hobbyists in Germany, Russia, England, Holland, etc all with the same goals, right? Uh, maintain Indian customs and, cultural ac and culture accurately. Promote an under the understanding of Native American traditions. Provide a knowledge and fellowship for interested persons and maintain a connection to a spiritual earth. And here are some of the pictures of the recent hobbyists. This is actually a German man right here, okay? And uh, all these people are Anglo or white, okay? But they sure do pass the eye test, don't they? So what is the effect of the uh, Boy Scouts and Mary Ace, the hobbyists, and well, Hollywood, which we clearly don't have time to talk about? Um, it skewed Americans' perceptions of Native Americans. Indians are, even today, seen as primitive. We are tied to the 19th century. When we see Indians that don't meet our idea of what an Indian should look like, we don't recognize them as Indians. Okay? Um, Indians are inexorably tied to nature. They are in harmony. We are of nature. Indians' culture is exotic, quaint, but in no way valid. Indians are extinct, is often a, a common misperception. And because of this, white people can out Indian Indians. And this is a common theme in Hollywood and everything else. Um, you know, I still, I can't remember who it was that was fighting Jack Palance, and Jack Palance was a you know, native warrior, and he beats him in a hand of hand knife combat, and so on and so forth. Anyway, those these kinds of things. Basically, what has that done to identity? Well, Americans have co-opted. Uh, we've greatly influenced American identity during the latter half of the 19th century and the early decades of the 20th century. The Sioux contributed significantly to the emerging identity of the modern American. We maintained masculinity and ties to nature because of the Sioux. We were still good, strong American men. Okay, and the Lakota culture is being adopted by Americans. It's, it's valuable in and of itself. Um, Native Americans become stuck in the 19th century, and you can look at Philip Deloria's books, Playing Indian or Indians in Unexpected Places, phenomenally brilliant, fun books to read, where he takes pictures of like an Indian sitting under a hairdryer, and everybody's shocked because nobody expects to see an Indian sitting under a hairdryer, or you don't expect to see an Indian in a car. Why not? We go to the hairdresser, I drive a car. Um, 
what are the, so what's basically gonna what's happening here with American identity? Um, we still incorporate much of what Native Americans espouse in, culturally as, as, as our own, as Americans. And it's nice because I can speak in both worlds. I'm Indian, but I'm also assimilated American. Um, and, uh, so what's the next generation of Lakota? i just like to close with this. This is the next generation of Lakota. Lorian Means, at three years old, her name is Tachinuba Ota, or her many pipes. She, uh, this is my daughter. She... Uh, doesn't look Indian, though, does she? What's wrong with this picture? Okay, she's on a horse, check. But she's blonde. Her mother and I both have dark hair. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> hmm. Anyway, uh, that's the next generation. So the next time you meet anyone, you can always wonder, are they Indian? They're blonde and blue-eyed. Are they Indian? Okay, what kind of cultural baggage, what kind of perception do I have of them based upon Hollywood, based upon hobbyist movements, based upon my time in the Boy Scouts? Are Native Americans of the 21st century? Absolutely. Most Native American authors today don't write about the 19th century. Sherman Alexie, Smoke Signals, various different books like this, all of his characters are contemporary Indians. Native Americans don't see themselves in the 19th century. They see themselves today. Questions? Okay. Oh, sorry. What time is it? Uh, after oh. 10. Um, anyway, let's take a break. Uh, we don't have time for questions. Um, <laughs> I planned that. <laughs> however, please save them for lunchtime. Uh, th it'll be, he'll be a fair target then. Um, and we'll come back in about uh, 11 minutes and um, hear Susan Moldenhauer's talk. Thank you.